Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org, IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, working to improve cybersecurity and provide policy guidance through partnerships with industry, government, and academia. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. There's consensus that Indiana's infrastructure is suffering from neglect. Half a million dollars to, to you and me seems like a whole lot of money. In the grand scheme of road projects, it doesn't go very far. Ahead, we break down the proposals and explain how likely it is that you'll be paying more at the pump to help fund the state's infrastructure. Plus, our Statehouse reporter joins us for an update on the legislative session. And hundreds of thousands of birds have been euthanized as Indiana deals with an outbreak of avian flu. Indiana ranks fourth in the country for turkey production, so we ask what impact this is going to have on farmers and on consumers. For the first time in nearly a century, hunters can trap river otters. Sticking in here like this. Coming up, why the trapping season might end sooner than expected. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. The road funding debate gripping the State House this year has led to a strange dynamic. Republican Governor Mike Pence and Democrats are pushing back against a House GOP plan to raise taxes. Drew Dodlin reports. Governor Pence often trumpets that Indiana roads are in better condition than most other places in the country. In reality, the data is mixed. In 2010, the state received a C-minus grade on roads from the American Society of Civil Engineers. That's a bit higher than the national average. The group gave the United States a D grade for roads in 2013. But a recent study commissioned by state lawmakers puts Indiana's roads in the bottom third of the country. In the city of LaPorte, Mayor Blair Milo doesn't see the quality of Indiana's roadways as something to brag about. Milo says for as long as she's been in office, road conditions have been a problem. That any time we've been able to do any kind of pavement work over the last uh, four years, it's really been being able to cobble together some funds to be able to address uh, pretty much dire needs. Being just south of Lake Michigan, low temperatures and heavy snow during winter months don't bode well for the pavement in LaPorte. And after years of being neglected, the roads are crumbling. So we had a number of years that no maintenance occurred, no paving, uh, very little crack ceiling even could go on, let alone the kind of reconstruction that really needs to happen on the bulk of our roads. It's a problem lawmakers have largely been punting on for years. They assigned some money in the 2013 budget for state and local road maintenance, but it only covered long overdue repairs. Then, this summer, traffic on I-65 near West Lafayette snarled to a halt. A bridge was sinking, and DOT immediately shut down the northbound lanes while crews worked around the clock to make repairs. Hoosiers were frustrated and pointed fingers at the state for not putting more money into road maintenance coffers. Valparaiso Republican Representative Ed Soliday is the author of a new House bill he says is years in the making. It includes a four-cent gas tax increase, which he says amounts to about $25 more a year for the average Hoosier driver. And the measure also shifts more funds from the sales tax on gas to support infrastructure. The sales tax on gasoline at 7% was paid by people who used the roads, but yet it was going to pay for all kinds of things, education, Medicaid, and actually was building surpluses. The House bill also includes a $1 increase on the cigarette tax, which would go towards Medicaid. That would replace funds shifted from the sales tax on gas, and it creates a matching grant program for communities around the state. Cities and counties can use a variety of new and expanded local tax options in the bill to raise funds, which the state will then match. Milo and other mayors laud the idea. We have to look at having different kinds of tools available to us because of the fact that tax caps significantly restrict our abilities in any kind of financial model. 
In his State of the State address this month, Pence attacked the House Republicans' bill and said he wouldn't support any plan that included a tax increase. I think when you've got money in the bank and you've got the best credit rating in America, the last place you should look to pay for roads and bridges is the wallets and the pocketbooks of hard-working Hoosiers. Soliday argues that getting the amount of money needed for roads, which he estimates to be about $1 billion a year, would require an irresponsible amount of money to be taken out of state reserves. And critics also argue that Pence's plan to use bonding as another funding tool is flawed because the roads would be in disrepair, or at least in need of significant maintenance, before the state is able to pay off the bonds. A third plan offered by Senate Republicans aims to help local roads, working in concert with Pence's state road plan. The bill's author, Brant Hirschman, says it differs from the House bill in that it would include no tax increases and would only create a one-time distribution of funds. But it is so much money that's being distributed that it will probably pay for two to three years worth of transportation funding at the local level. Hirschman says the plan would serve as a bridge to a long-term solution, and Pence has thrown his support behind it. Back in Laporte, Milo says to get the city's roads to an acceptable level will cost around $18 million. Under the Senate bill, the city would receive just over 600000 Half a million dollars to, to you and me seems like a whole lot of money. In the grand scheme of road projects, it doesn't go very far. But Hirschman says he has no problem with the amount of money going out in his bill. Especially, he says, since it exists in addition to local revenue streams from state gas tax funding and local property and income taxes. So this is just, I would say, one-time frosting on the cake but it's thick frosting. The amount of money cities and towns would receive under the Senate bill is based on income tax revenue, which some have posited would give wealthy communities a disproportionate amount. Zionsville, with roughly the same population as Laporte, would receive almost six times more than Laporte. For Indiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Drew Dodlin at the State House. Both the Senate and House bills passed through their first hearings. House Republicans blocked an amendment from Democrats Wednesday that would have removed the tax increases from their bill. Well, from road funding to ISTEP, it's been a busy week for the General Assembly. Joining us now to take a look at some of the action is our State House reporter, Brandon Smith. Hi, Brandon. You know, we've been reporting that legislation that would hold schools and teachers harmless for this year's ISTEP scores was headed to the governor. Where did those bills stand? Well, the governor signed both of those bills into law Thursday. They become effective immediately and ensure that schools and teachers aren't negatively impacted by this year's low I-STEP scores. And this week, uh, Brendan lawmakers discussed another I-STEP bill. This one calls for an outside group to rescore last year's test, but that comes with a hefty price tag. Yeah, the House Education Committee heard a bill for the first time this week that, yes, calls for a, a rescore of the I-STEP test. Now, House Education Committee Chair Bob Baining wrote the bill, and what he says is that he wants to ensure going forward, when we calculate student growth on these tests from year to year, that the baseline score of this year is correct. But a complete rescore is very expensive, and a testing consultant the state uses is recommending just a partial rescore. Another focus of the year has been curbing meth production. There were a few proposals aimed at making it more difficult to get pseudoephedrine. What options are still on the table? Well, there are still a host of options out there. One is the so-called nosy pharmacist bill. This would require pharmacists to question people who are trying to buy pseudoephedrine products to make sure that they are buying them for legitimate reasons. Another bill would ban drug felons from buying pseudoephedrine products, and another would allow people to buy a limited supply of the drugs before having to get a prescription. And there's a problem surrounding big box stores and property tax. The big box stores have found ways to pay lower income taxes, but then it's taking money away from counties across Indiana. So now lawmakers are considering legislation they hope would solve the problem, but Brandon, this really gets complicated. It may be the most complicated issue I've ever covered here at the State House. Basically, a series of tax court rulings have made it so that big box stores can compare themselves to any other store in a general retail market for the purposes of determining their property tax bill. But people say that's comparing apples to oranges. Now, here's House Ways and Means Chair Tim Brown talking about what happens to a department store when a large corporation leaves it. Well, what is happening around the country a lot of places is they're becoming uh, almost strip malls where the back part of the store becomes empty or the back part of the store becomes storage and the front part of the store is what becomes the storefront. 
Without getting too much into the weeds on this, what lawmakers are trying to do is make sure that these stores that use all of their space aren't assessed the same way as the ones with this empty space in them. But here's the issue. Even if they pass the bill, we won't know its effectiveness for months or maybe even years. First, the Department of Local Government Finance will develop rules based on the bill. Then property tax boards will have hearings, and the issue will likely eventually get to the Indiana Tax Court. Okay, moving along, we've been following a bill that will open adoption records from Indiana's closed adoption era. Now, last year, Governor Pence derailed the bill. Is there any reason to think that he won't do that again if the bill were to advance? Yes, and it's because this year's bill is very different. Last year, it, the bill simply would have opened up the records unless a birth mother proactively went to the state and said, keep them sealed. This year, birth mothers have a few options. They can keep the records sealed entirely, or they can allow their children to have contact through an intermediary, or allow their children access to just her medical records. And we've already seen lawmakers who voted against the bill last year voting yes this time around precisely because of those changes. Okay, and it's likely the most anticipated debate this session, LGBT civil rights, but there are two bills. When are those up for discussion? We will hear those arguments in committee Wednesday. All right, thank you very much, Brandon. Thanks, Joe. And now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. The truck driver who caused a historic Paoli bridge to collapse will appear in court Monday. 23-year-old Mary Lambright faces several charges, including reckless operation of a tractor trailer. Police say Lambright ignored the sign marking the six-ton weight limit when she drove over the South Gospel Street Bridge on Christmas Day. The bridge collapsed. County commissioners say it will cost roughly $1 million to repair. The former Indiana University student accused of attacking a Muslim woman in Bloomington will also be in court next week. Back in October, police say Tristan Bickford attacked a Muslim woman outside Sofa Cafe while yelling racially charged comments. Bickford was expelled from IU after the incident and the FBI opened a federal hate crime investigation. He faces several charges, including strangulation, intimidation and battery resulting in bodily harm. Well, you may, re may remember the bill covering regulations on high-fenced hunting areas. As the proposal begins to move through the Senate, two amendments by Democrats are now gone. One amendment added regulations barring people from hunting go goat and sheep. The other barred the creation of any new high-fenced hunting preserves. Both were defeated in committee. Lawmakers introduced the legislation after a decade-long court batter battle negated state authority over the industry. Well, state lawmakers can carry guns in the state house, and they want their staff members to be able to do the same. A Senate committee approved a bill this week that would give them that permission. The bill's author says allowing staff members to defend themselves is especially important, considering what he calls the dangerous area surrounding their workplace in downtown Indianapolis. The bill is headed to the Senate floor. Seven Oaks Classical School is aiming for an August opening. The charter school was given authorization by Grace College after four years of seeking approval. The school have a foundation in classical languages and plans to teach Latin to students in early grades. The school hopes to enroll 400 students in its opening year. Duke Energy is proposing an infrastructure improvement plan that would increase rates in Indiana. The plan includes installing advanced metering throughout the state and replacing or improving substations, circuit breakers, transformers, poles, and lines. Work would start this year and continue through 2023, and rates would increase around 1% each year. There's an open public comment period going on now. The state's regulatory commission is expected to make a decision this summer. Well, when you head to the pump, you'll be happy to see prices are continuing to drop. Some parts of Indiana are seeing prices near 130 per gallon. Falling gas prices started last year as crude oil hit its lowest price in a decade. Well, Martin Luther King Jr. Day is often viewed as a day on, not a day off. People across the nation spent the day volunteering and reflecting on the civil rights leader's legacy. J.D. Gray reports. The holiday started with a leadership breakfast at Indiana University, where journalist Soledad O'Brien spoke to students and community members. What do you stand for? And what do you stand up for? And I think ultimately it's how you answer this question that determines if your life is successful or not. 
The sentiments were similar at Bloomington's Buskirk Chumley Theater, where African music filled the room. Well, these are great days like this to help try to inspire us. You know, this community is full of people and institutions that do work hard uh, year-round to make it a better community, but we all have work to do. Member of the Ferguson Commission, Brittany Packnett, said what happens every other day of the year is even more important. She spoke at several events throughout the community. Freedom work will always be uh, more important than it is popular. So whether it was the tear gas that filled our lungs or the hate blogs and emails that followed our Oval Office visit, it was Dr. King's willingness to not only speak unpopular truths, but to do it boldly that stood as a personal and critical example. For Indiana News Desk, I'm J.D. Gray. And Joe, more than 3,000 Bloomington residents volunteered on the holiday, so they clearly really took those messages wow, to heart. That's great. Thanks, Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. An outbreak of bird flu has the state's largest turkey producing county on high alert. Coming up, we'll take you to the site of the outbreak where all hands are on deck to make sure the deadly virus doesn't spread. River otters had disappeared from Indiana's rivers, but now they're overpopulating them. Ahead, why the state's new method of controlling the animals is drawing criticism. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. I can change the world with my own two hands. Make it a better place with my own two hands. I'm going to make it a brighter place with my own two hands. I'm gonna help the human race with my own two hands. I can hold you in my own two hands, and I can comfort you with my own two hands. With my own Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Hundreds of thousands of birds have been euthanized because of an avian flu outbreak in Du Bois County. Indiana ranks fourth in the nation for turkey production and Du Bois County makes up most of that. As Becca Costello reports, the outbreak seems to be contained, but the implications could be long lasting. The outbreak began last week when turkeys at Kalb Farm tested positive for the H7N8 strain of avian influenza. Once the USDA was informed, they responded by quarantining the farm and setting up a control area of 10 kilometers and a surveillance zone of an additional 10 kilometers. Nine other commercial turkey farms have tested positive. All of the flocks, more than 400,000 birds, have now been depopulated. Some chickens have also been euthanized because they came into contact with the infected birds. Our commercial industry um, has a very strong hold on biosecurity and they've been doing a lot uh, recently in preparation efforts from last year's outbreak of avian, avian influenza. USDA officials and officers from the Indiana Homeland Security are still testing birds on area farms. They've set up a command center at the Vincennes University Jasper campus. All commercial poultry farms located in the surveillance zone have completed at least one round of negative tests. It's too soon to predict the extent of the economic damage this outbreak will have, but there's no doubt it will be difficult for this community. This particular strain of avian influenza, it's the, similar to the strain that was here last year, or that was in the U.S. last year, and that strain, while causing billion, so, some odd amounts of dollars of damage from all the cold birds, didn't infect anybody. Um, it's not the H9 strain that was killing people in China. The USDA says poultry and eggs are still safe to eat, but local business owners are concerned about a possible shortage of local meat and eggs. Either way, it's going to affect my customers, whether or not they have what they want for lunch or whether or not they have to pay a higher price. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very big deal. The USDA responded quickly to Du Bois County once they were alerted to the problem. They'd been planning for a situation like this since last year, when a similar flu strain, H5N2, led to the death of 48 million birds. 
Surveillance will continue for at least 21 days after the last positive test for the avian flu virus is reported, before this outbreak is declared over. If any birds test positive in that time, the 21-day timer will have to reset. In the meantime, farmers and business owners will have to wait to find out the extent of the economic impact. I've only thought about it in terms of my business and, and other people's business. You know, there are other places that serve um, turkey and, and meat here that it's not just me, so it, it could affect a lot of people. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Becca Costello. And we're joined now by Luis Santiago. He's part of the Purdue Extension in Davies County. He's also worked in the poultry industry for years. Thanks so much for Thank being you. with us today. Nice and to we just here. heard from someone in that story in the cafe who's really concerned about her business. So what kind of economic impact is this going to have? Well, uh, as far as the economic impact, you can you can expect that, especially on that local area, it's going to be more of a, a zone specific. Uh, you have uh, the farmers that have been lost their, their, their birds and it's uh, uncertain at this point until all the process of the composting and clearance is done that they don't know when they're going to be able to go back again in production. So uh, the, there's, uh, there's some, there's some areas that are going to be more impacted on that. Uh, as far as the general uh, nationwide, it's, uh, it's very insignificant based on some economies. So, uh, it's been more on the side of the farmers more than anything else that they want to be affected. Sure, and well, you've been in the poultry industry for years. Now, if you're a poultry farmer in southern Indiana, what's going through the minds of them right now? Well, uh, definitely going to have to be a lot of mixed feelings. Uh, you work, this is your livelihood, you know, uh, the source of income. So. You try to do your best to follow all the guidelines, all the best management practice to keep the biosecurity in your farm to avoid this kind of situation. And even though that you have done everything possible to, to do what is right, uh, you st still feel responsible for it. I mean, it is, it is a very heartbreaking situation. The disease has seemed to stop in Du Bois County, but we know that the USDA will be looking for signs. What, what, what kind of signs will they be looking for these next three weeks before they can officially say it's done? Well, they already tested a lot of uh, backyard flocks and commercial flocks in the area, and so far they have been tested negative. So what they do, and they continue on that process until they have a 21-day window to uh, confirm that it's clear of the disease. Uh, and okay. after that, then they will take the, the steps to sure. start production again. Thank you very much for being here today. Appreciate it. Thank you. We're halfway into the state's first river otter trapping season in decades, and Hoosiers have already caught hundreds of otters. The Department of Natural Resources says trapping helps address overpopulation. But as Harrison Wagner reports, wildlife groups worry the practice could cause the river otter to once again be eliminated. You can use sticks. Derek Baroshak has been trapping since the age of 14. Now, Baroshak is a director of the Indiana State Trapping Association, as well as the owner of Wildlife Control Services, a company specializing in the removal and relocation of nuisance wildlife. This is the loose jaw, and you push on it, and it snaps. That's just the lake. Baroshak has dealt with a variety of animals, from coyotes to groundhogs to beavers. But while on a call for a beaver in summer 2014, Baroshak trapped something unexpected a river otter. The beaver was damming up a drainage ditch like what we got right out here. And I set a trap strictly for beaver, but an otter went through there and I got him caught. River otters disappeared in Indiana in the 1920s as a result of over-trapping. A coordinated effort from the Indiana Department of Natural Resources and the State Trapping Association in the 1990s brought otters from Louisiana back to northern and southern Indiana. Since the reintroduction, the population has exploded, prompting the need for recreational trapping to maintain the population. For the first time in nearly a century, the DNR is allowing limited trapping of river otters in the state, allowing up to 600 total otters to be trapped across 66 counties. It's already halfway through the four-month season. And we're at 470-some otters reported on the uh, online check-in, so um, we'll probably expect getting to the quota. The season will stop once trappers reach the state's quota. The DNR has faced strong opposition from groups like the Humane Society, who argue that trapping of any animal is inhumane and have suggested other means of dealing with overpopulation, including educating the public. 
but the DNR maintains that trapping is a tried and true method of controlling animal population. You know, it's, it's a recognized uh, wildlife management tool, trapping to, to not, uh, in some cases, control, but to manage fur bearing populations. Baroshak also recognizes the need for humane trapping and believes that it's better than the alternative. People think these trappers out here, you guys are big mean, mean guys, you're out here killing these animals. I guarantee you getting caught in a body grip of trap is a lot better than dying from mange. It takes you 30 days, if not longer, to die and it eats, all your fur falls off and you're out here in zero degree weather. That's a horrible death. As for the future of trapping in the state, Johnson says potential changes in the scale of river otter trapping likely won't take effect within the next three years. Um, I, can't, I can't imagine that, that zone, those zones would change dramatically in, in three years. I would think they'd be pretty consistent. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Harrison Wagner. And before we go, just a winter weather advisory for the folks down south in Salem, French Lick, one to four inches of snow by Saturday morning. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUNews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, working to improve cybersecurity and provide policy guidance through partnerships with industry, government, and academia. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, fiber internet, HD, and digital IPTV in southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.